Hello and welcome to Business Agenda SA. In this series, we'll lift the lid on South Australian business. We'll discover the innovation, creativity and industriousness that's driving our most successful companies forward. Coming up on today's program. We look at the huge potential for agribusiness in feeding the hungry dragon that is China. In the aftermath of the Christchurch earthquakes, we find out what South Australian businesses have been doing to help with the rebuild. And we explore the myriad of options available for financing your business. China has traditionally met its own needs in terms of food production, but it's now become a net importer. Massive investment in infrastructure and changing socio-economic conditions are dramatically changing the landscape. The increasingly affluent urban Chinese population is concerned with food quality and safety. Cameron reports on what this opportunity means for South Australian producers. When we think of trade with China, we often think of the mining industry. But with a growing population of 1.3 billion people and demand for products such as beef, lamb, seafood, wine and dairy growing at an ever faster pace, the opportunity for Australian agribusiness is huge. In South Australia in particular, we have a reputation for clean, green and reliable food production. We couldn't be better placed to take advantage of the China opportunity. If you're a food producer wanting to get into the Chinese market, where do you go for advice? We asked ANZ agribusiness specialist Kim Darcy to lend his expertise. Agribusiness describes everything from aquaculture, horticulture to broadacre. In reality, China is, there's a greater demand for aquacultural products. Take the example of South Australian owned Flurio Milk Company. Jeff Hutchinson and his partners are a local business ideally placed to take on the massive Chinese market. Their journey so far has been a fascinating one. Things were tight, um, you know, we, we were getting paid 28 cents a litre for milk and it was costing us roughly 33 cents a litre to pr produce it at that stage. So, so we were steadily going backwards and uh, we decided to uh, bite the bullet and borrow some money and, and set up our own plants. I guess the business grew from there. Um, the next two years was chasing plant and machinery and getting ourselves up and running. And approximately eight years ago, I guess we bottled our first bottle of milk and it's steadily grown from there. Uh, the yogurt's been up and running now for about three years. Yeah, we, we initially um, set up a joint venture with a Queensland company with the idea of creating a market down here. From then, uh, with ANZ's help, we've gone and built ourselves a processing plant down here so we do everything on site. Back in China, the social and economic landscape is changing rapidly. Whilst the population is growing, there also there's an urbanisation that's occurring. So people are moving from the rural communities into urbanised areas. And we're seeing middle incomes rise as well. As middle incomes are rising, people are demanding uh, better quality food and beverage and more higher protein content in that food. With that in mind, for dairy producer Jeff, milk powder would potentially give him an entry into the Chinese marketplace. The potential with milk powder is huge and it's obviously fairly large through China anyhow and uh, or through Asian regions. Once again it goes back to um, the ability of refrigeration and shelf life and the powder is an obvious solution to those problems. The Chinese consumer is drawn to high quality, so in that regard Flurio Milk and many other Australian companies are already well placed. With Australia's production around that higher quality piece of food and beverage, we are uniquely positioned. So geography is good, but we also are providing a fantastic product for the Chinese market. You have to start to balance up. Have I got the capacity within my existing operation to produce the product that I need to send to China without impacting my local customers? I think as far as the factory goes, we're not at 50% capacity at this stage. And and we'd certainly be looking to increase it to full capacity and, and worry about our next step then. But we've certainly looked into export. We're working our way through Aquas accreditation at the moment. We believe there's a fair market out there to be able to get it to another country and, and still have a decent amount of expiry on it. We have 700 people sitting in China. And so when it comes to directing people overseas and putting them into contact, we've got ANZ people at both ends of the transaction. So we can actually get our ANZ people in Hong Kong, in Shanghai, in Beijing to introduce our small business customers to the local contacts. We get a number of inquiries from throughout Asia, a small entrepreneurial type of bloke that uh, wants to have a bit of a crack at getting dairy products into Asia and I think the size and scale of, of things that are available over there we're mad not to have a look at it. 
Australian agricultural exports are set to double by 2050. The key for South Australian businesses will be determining what their market wants and how to get it to them. Getting good advice will be imperative during this process, but with 17 million babies being born in China each year, the demand for our produce will only increase. For more information or a copy of ANZ's Feeding the Dragon report, go to anz.com forward slash in Asia. Professor Jiran Rus is the founder of Intellectual Capital Services Limited. He pioneered the modern field of intellectual capital science and is a recognised world expert in innovation management and strategy. Each week he'll give us his insights into innovation, starting with why it's important to South Australia's economy. When you talk about innovation from the standpoint of a jurisdiction, a country or a state, innovation is the fundamental driver of economic growth. And of course, as a state, you need economic growth because that generates the surplus that allows you to then spend money on things that people want, like infrastructure, like hospital and healthcare, like education. So without that innovation, we do not have that money. And hence, innovation is critically important for countries and jurisdictions. Innovation is frequently confused with research, uh, and I think it's important to define the distinction between the two, and I'm going to make a very simplified distinction. So research is the ability to convert money to knowledge. Innovation is the ability to convert knowledge to money. And a good innovation is the ability to come up with something new, the ability to bring it to market, the ability to ensure that it results in money paid. If you don't do all those three things, you don't have an innovation. For more information, go to demita.sa.gov.au. Coming up after the break, we take a look at how Adelaide is helping its sister city, Christchurch, to rebuild. Welcome back to Business Agenda SA. On February 22, 2011, Christchurch was hit by a magnitude 6.3 earthquake. 185 people were killed and thousands more injured, and New Zealand's second largest city was left in ruins. It was the most violent thing that any of us had ever experienced in our lives. There was no way that you could stand or walk You couldn't really control yourself at all during that time, so you were thrown around like a rag doll. Immediately, the major action stopped. I could see a pall of dust rising up from the city, and uh, I knew that that meant that we'd had a lot of building collapses. Christchurch has a unique architectural history, and unfortunately, it's all but gone and that's something that uh, will be very difficult to replace um, culturally, historically. There are a few things remaining, but uh, I think the opportunity really needs to be what's, what can the future be. Christchurch's future has been reimagined in a blueprint that draws on 106,000 ideas gathered during an extensive period of public consultation. Adelaide-based architecture company Woods Baggett were part of a team invited to translate these ideas into a spatial plan. So imagine a city where you've got all of the main key institutional buildings, none of them exist anymore, and your task is to decide where they are to be located. And our key strategy was to locate the buildings where they would have the most benefit. We also wanted to locate those buildings near some of the key spaces that were the historic fabric. So whilst the buildings have gone, the river and the plazas and the squares remain and they are the, the cultural heart of the city. So we located these buildings where they would engage with the river and engage with the squares and the plazas. So that was a key strategy of we don't have any of the tr original fabric left, but we do have the map of the city. With close to 80% of the CBD in need of rebuilding, SA Business recently led a trade mission out to Christchurch to explore the opportunities. There's an understandable cynicism in Christchurch about the 
range of companies and people who turn up, we're here to help because it's a $40 billion rebuild. To put that in the context, that's all of the investment in the riverbank in South Australia at the moment happening every year for the next 10 years in Christchurch. The opportunities in Christchurch are absolutely stunning. In a world where growth has been reasonably static for a long time, this is a bubble of opportunity. An opportunity to help and an opportunity to benefit financially. But with loss of lives and livelihoods, the nature of the approach was key. What's really important about this story is that Adelaide and Christchurch have a long-term sister city relationship. And you can imagine living in a city like Christchurch with incredible devastation and everybody's arrived. Japan, America, Europe. But the key thing was that we had to collaborate with Canterbury businesses. They didn't want somebody charging in on a white horse and saying, we can do it better than you, we know more than you do. It was very much how we could link a business to business connection. When you go into a, another market, local knowledge is incredibly important. We've got some big Australian firms working in New Zealand now uh, in, the, uh, in the construction area, but in a lot of other areas as well. And the most successful relationships have come out of organisations that have taken on a local partner. There's no way Woods Bagot would have been able to achieve the outcomes by themselves um, and perhaps no way the local firms would have achieved them without us. So we are teaming up with and, and contributing our skills where there's, a, where there's a gap. The trade mission was a big success with most of the delegates striking up new business relationships. One of these was Mawson Lake's manufacturing company Tindo Solar. One of the partners we're working with is, is Solar Architects um, and they have a great reputation of, of leading, leading design uh, and so it, clearly it's a nice synergy between what we do with you know, leading innovation, leading design high quality with what they are doing, what they're aiming to do in Christchurch. We've been very happy to work with them today. We found it easy, we, we speak the same language, we're not far across the ditch. I think the photovoltaic market is now more available to the, the householder and Tindo Solar is a well-presented, well-performing product. Clearly there is a significant need to do a lot of rebuilding there uh, and it's a no-brainer to think, well, let's try and do it in a clean, green way up front. So collaboration is key to companies looking to assist in the rebuild, but there's a lesson there for the wider economy too. In a small to medium-sized enterprise state like South Australia, we haven't had an actual disaster, thankfully. But in many ways we're heading towards an economic disaster with you know, manufacturing and retail and so many areas of our, um, of our traditional economy under threat. And so the lesson for us out of Christchurch was not only how they've collaborated under a natural disaster, how we can collaborate facing economically tough times as well. We all have businesses, we're all looking for opportunities. It's unusual when the opportunity aligns with a genuine need. We're very excited about the opportunity of doing business with Adelaide. If what has happened here uh, can uh, help our brothers and sisters across the Tasman in their commercial enterprises, then it's a win-win game for all of us. This is an extraordinary, you know, historical opportunity to be part of the reinvention of a city that will be a wonderful, global, vibrant, boutique city with extraordinary things to offer. And we can be at the we are at the ground level of that and that, that will continue for the next decade and beyond. So Cameron, we know that there are some local businesses who are establishing relationships in Christchurch, but what about the, the other small to medium businesses here in South Australia? How do they get a foot in the door? Look, small to medium businesses that may not have exported before should collaborate over here, figure out what they can offer as a group, and then see what is available on the ground in Christchurch. We need to remember that this is going to be a 10 year process, something like 70 to 80% of the city was destroyed. So there is a lot of opportunity and it's going to be ongoing. How important is the sister city relationship to those business deals? We've had a 40 year relationship with Christchurch. That's something that we can build on and it's a very good base to build on and we can deepen and strengthen that in a business sense. But at the end of the day, we've got to realise that it will be commercial imperatives which will drive deals. All right, coming up in the program, Justine Northey takes a look at business finance.
Running a successful enterprise requires vision, determination and money. The first two are up to you. To help with the third, Justine Northey went out to explore the many options available for financing your business. Cash flow and investment capital are vital to businesses, but they're often one of the most challenging hurdles to overcome. To give you a hand with your finance, I spoke to the pros for some of their valuable advice on the many different options available, including some you may have never thought of before. New to the world of finance and growing rapidly in the online space is crowdfunding. I think over the next five years, it'll be a very exciting space to watch. And in South Australia, there are a lot of businesses out there right now, and some fantastic businesses that are using crowdfunding to their advantage. But crowdfunding may not be for everyone. Another option is established organisations like the banks. At ANZ, we're very much open for business. Uh, in the last uh, 12 months, we will lend over $1.2 billion to businesses in South Australia. In addition to that, across Australia, we have a $1 billion pledge to lend money to startups. In fact, there are a myriad of options available. It's all about finding what works for you and your business. Often the best place to look is, is really in your own business. There's a lot of lazy balance sheets where you can uh, release cash quite easily. And you'll be amazed when times are tough just how much uh, cash you have in your own business. Uh, outside of that, there are many other good sources too and some really uh, interesting uh, places to get money from, particularly here in South Australia. If you thought angels existed only in fairy tales, think again. Uh, angels are high net worth individuals that have made their money and are now looking to reinvest small parts of their money back into businesses. Now, high net worth individuals uh, have their own idiosyncrasies, but at the same time, they can be fantastic mentors of someone that's been there and done that to help you grow your business. What are we looking for when providing finance is um, documentation to support the loan, a business plan, a cash flow forecast, things like that. We're looking for the quality of the people involved in the business, the business owner themselves, but any other people in the business. We also have the saying called skin in the game. So that is, this is about when a business might come to the table and say, look, I'm prepared to put $50,000 into the business. If the bank puts in $100,000, then we put that together and that makes a much stronger proposition because the business is putting their own money in. Ultimately, that um, adds weight to a, to, to a lending proposal. It's all very sound advice so far, and there's no harm in thinking even further outside the square, like joint ventures with your competitors. In business, you are so busy competing and you're so busy seeing your competitors as somebody that you want to push down to pull yourself up. But often, joint ventures are a great way to source funding for opportunities that you don't have. How important is it to investigate all of your options? It's vital to choose the right package because it ultimately affects the viability of the business and the cash flow of the business. The trick is to have a clear vision for your business and make sure you get the right advice. That way you should have no trouble finding the funds you need to take your enterprise to the next level. Up next, Adelaide's top tweeter, Michelle Prack, helps demystify all things social media. I can't believe you've got eight more Twitter followers than I do. Eat your heart out, Cam. Oh, welcome back. With over two million Australians using Twitter and over 11 million on Facebook, it's highly likely your customers spend a good deal of time in social media. For business, this means fishing where the fish are, and that means getting online. But never fear, Pracky is here. In the first of her weekly segments, she has some great advice on how to get started. One of the most daunting things about having a social media presence can be thinking of something to say. What are you going to tweet about? What are you going to post on your Facebook page? What will you share on your blog? For business, this can be particularly tricky because you begin to get an inkling that good social media management takes time. The first thing to recognise is social media isn't all about you. There's a worldwide conversation taking place already. 
Find others in your industry on Twitter. Search for existing online communities or groups in Facebook and LinkedIn. Listen to what's happening in your industry now. And when you're comfortable, join in. The second thing is to be prepared. Have a content calendar. That's a schedule of ideas for things you might possibly talk about. Ideally, your content calendar will look ahead at the next 12 months. A calendar could be a Word document, an Excel spreadsheet, whatever you enjoy using, but it will plot out what you talk about on social media. It will contain business news, staff appointments, new product launches, and things that are pertinent to your industry. Your content calendar should also recognise what's important to the wider community. What can you tap into so that your social media content resonates with them? Share your areas of expertise and demonstrate to others that you really know your business. Finally, don't be afraid to show some personality. Treat social networking like real world networking. Be warm and approachable and friendly. Don't only talk business. If you would like to join in on the Business Agenda conversation, use our Twitter handle at BizAgenda. We can also be found at facebook.com forward slash businessagendaSA and you can catch up with the program at businessagenda.tv. And coming up next week... We take a look at the defence industry in South Australia and how some companies are diversifying into other areas. We investigate the new business incubator that's attracting people from across the globe. And Justine takes a look at the latest in marketing trends. Thanks so much for your company today. See you next week. Goodbye.